Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. Today, we are going to be discussing a true gem of high strangeness, that of the Point Isabel phantasm. So this case occurred, perhaps unsurprisingly, in Point Isabel, Ohio in 1964, and it involves a woman referred to only by her married name, Mrs. Lister, who was 18 at the time of the sighting and with her future husband, then boyfriend, Lou. Now, the young couple was sitting in a parked car with the lights out around 11 o'clock in the evening, just a few miles away from Mrs. Lister's mother's farm. Suddenly, they noticed someone or something kind of moving across a nearby field. Immediately, they turned the headlights on to get a better look and see who this intruder was. And it was at this point that not only did they get a good look at what they would realize was some sort of bizarre creature, but the creature also noticed them. Mrs. Lister described the beast as being, well, horrible. She said that it was broad-shouldered and at least six feet tall with a pointed noggin, and that it had a wrinkled brow, narrow chin with large pig-like ears, as well as a pig-like snout for a nose. Add into this fanged teeth and glowing orange eyes, and yeah, you have a face that sounds fairly horrible indeed. The whole creature was covered in kind of fuzzy fur, and she said that it had human-like hands. However, the worst of it was far from over. As soon as they flicked on the headlights, Mrs. Lister said that it did appear like it noticed them and immediately proceeded to approach the vehicle. However, it didn't just simply like, you know, lope over to the car unhindered. It bounded over in large hops or leaps, even moving through three strands of barbed wire. When it finally made it close to the car, Mrs. Lister said that she screamed. The creature seemed to be taken aback by this, but not for long. It drew back and then immediately lunged forward as though it meant to go through the, de the windshield and grab Lou. Now, if you can believe it, this is where things get even weirder. The young couple tried and apparently failed to roll up the windows. Lou reached over to start the car and, according to Mrs. Lister, it didn't start. At least she claims that she didn't know if it started or not, but they continued to just sit there for a couple of minutes instead of making a speedy escape. So it's safe to assume that the car didn't start. Now, the vagueness around the memories comes from the fact that Mrs. Lister claims that she felt like she was being hypnotized by the creature's bright orange eyes, which she said focused into her own eyes. She described it as like being in a time lapse or in a different time. And in this state, she claimed that she couldn't hear anything and that she tried to scream, but actually wasn't even sure if she did or not. Now, bearing this strange, kind of vaguely sleep paralysis or hypnagogic state in mind, we come to the truly odd denouement of the encounter. Mrs. Lister said that amid all of this action, trying to get into the car and hypnotizing her with its eyes, the creature dropped down suddenly into a crouch, as though in slow motion. Its hands turned into paws, and it tr transitioned into a quadruped position. As soon as this was accomplished, it simply vanished. So where do we start with this truly bizarre encounter? Um, I mean, first of all, I think that, you know, it's interesting to note that here we see the very common, if not by now cliche, almost trope of a young couple sitting in a parked car on a desolate country road, um, and all of a sudden, boom, we have, for all intents and purposes, a monster. Now, in this case as well, we also have the interesting interplay of lights, both anomalous and man-made, um, that, you know, this is a perfect example of something that I've noticed across a lot of different encounters. It seems that lights really almost serve as some sort of narrative catalyst, whether they are anomalous or man-made. Now, of course, in this case, the man-made lights, the headlights, um, they really serve as kind of the beginning of the encounter. They Sure, they see this form walking over the field, but it's not until they turn on the headlights and the lights fall on the creature that it springs into action. Um, you know, again, it just... A catalyst is the perfect way to describe this. The lights seem to be the thing that sets this narrative in motion. Now, of course, could it be that, you know, like many creatures, the lights attracted its attention. Instead of being afraid, it came over to see what the matter was. Of course that could be. Um, but to me, it does seem to be evidence of sort of this general narrative scheme to these different anomalous encounters, which tend to share certain similarities one with the other. Now, of course, man-made lights are not the only light source in the story. We also have the creature's glowing orange eyes. Now, if the headlights kind of activated the narrative, the glowing eyes activated something else, and that was an almost hypnotic light state in the young witness, possibly witnesses, considering that both 
of the young couple were unable to roll up their windows. You know, again, it really seems to me that lights are one of the great keys to anomalous experiences. And of course, I tend to agree with John Keel and many other researchers in believing that they seem to be a fundamental part of the experience. Now, speaking of unreality, one of the main features of this case that launches it right into the territory of the Twilight Zone has got to be the shape-shifting, the changing shape of the being right in front of the frightened witnesses. Now, of course, the absolute first thing that this calls to mind um, is a handful of reports across the fantastic work of the late, great Linda Godfrey regarding cases mainly involving kind of dogman or man-wolf type beings, which appear to change shape right in front of a person's eyes. Now, this distinction in this case, especially of the beast's human-like hands changing into something more paw-like or claw-like, combined with kind of the fang-like teeth, really seems to launch it kind of close to werewolf land. Combine that with the fact that it apparently moved through three strands of barbed wire and then ended the whole affair by simply vanishing. You know, this really seems like something a little spookier than your friendly neighborhood hominid. Now, I know the concept of a shape-shifting and vanishing beast sounds decidedly fantastical, but it raises a really interesting point. There are countless sightings of UFOs that are said to change shape or simply vanish. Um, I mean, it's pretty much a calling card of ghosts to vanish into thin air or float through walls and other solid objects. To me, what this seems to point to, aside from a certain continuity across all of these apparently disparate types of phenomena, is that whatever these manifestations are, they are decidedly phantasmic or spectral in nature. Things that are not bound to exist solely um, by the known laws of the purely physical world, even if they do coincide with them for a time. So if you enjoyed this episode on the Point Isabel Phantasm, please like. And if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with me on my free blog at patreon.com. For today, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Doing.